Indeed, I had the, the privilege of uh, serving on a panel at the White House uh, about a month and a half ago on the, the workforce development needs of our nation. And they all focused on STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math. You know, the, the uh, NASA astronaut there, he said, we're going to put a man on Mars, and we didn't need to do STEM education. And then there's a DOE person talking about alternative energy, you know, nuclear energy and solar energy. We need STEM education. The head cyber security guru for the National Institute of uh, Standards and Testing, NIST, was there. He said science and technology, the naval research dial was there. We're developing new weapon systems. We need STEM education. Then it was my turn. Um, the ag guy had been invited to the table. And I said, you know, it's really great that y'all are thinking about all these wonderful things, about putting a man on Mars, et cetera. I dare say it's all moot if you can't f put food on the table. Indeed, that spaceship that needs to go to Mars needs to have food in it, one. Two, it's not enough to be focusing on the technical STEM education there, science, technology, engineering, and math. We've got to think about leadership skills, communication skills, uh, critical thinking skills. That's what our colleagues in colleges of liberal arts, particularly in the humanities, bring to the table. And we've been remiss in not thinking of those sorts of opportunities. As we're thinking of the curricula that we develop, we need to be thinking of how to incorporate that, not just in a course or two, but in a more purposeful, deliberate way. And a lot of the land-grant universities are doing that now. And indeed, the, uh, Dr. Lattimore and I were in a session yesterday. There's a woman from Monsanto, the vice president, uh, one of the vice presidents from Monsanto, and she was emphasizing that. There was a guy from the Go uh, Golf Course Superintendents Association, he emphasized that. There was a young lady from the Environmental Defense Fund. She emphasized that. So that's where the, the, the opportunity is to, to connect with uh, humanities and, and agricultural policy. And, and you know, what's sad is we've forgotten. When Justin Morrill came up with the Land Grant Act, he said there are three things that need, need to occur. One is practical agricultural and mechanical education. That's why Land Grant Universities have agricultural and engineering colleges in America. A&M, Texas A&M, et cetera. Agricultural and mechanical. Practical education, hands-on experience. We call it experiential education today. In those days, they call it practical education. The second thing that he talked about was military education. What, in modern-day parlance, it is leadership skills. That's what the military teaches. It doesn't, sure, they teach you how to use weapons and all that, but at the end of the day, it's the leadership, is the critical thinking. Sit me in the situation that you're in. The third thing that uh, Justin Morrill emphasized was humanities education. And unfortunately, over the years, decades, agricultural colleges have sort of lost that sense. And now there's a rethinking that we're having that that's very critical. Those sorts of things are very critical. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Mike Vick, uh, County Commission here. Yes, sir. Uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned the same, uh, trying to do things that are practical. Yes, sir. And I want you to address some of the, the uh, changes in the farm bill, the HR 60 or the which is before the House, five for five and vote down. Particularly, I want to address some of the things that's been cutting food assistance, SNAP, and uh, these type of things that are putting food on the table, yeah. as you're saying. Uh, so just to do that. All right. All right. So I'm going to have to punt on that. Okay. It's <laughs> way beyond my purview. <laughs> if I said anything about it, I'd be, you know, deep water not knowing much of it. I mean, I, I keep track of all those things, but I, I can't have... Now, you ask me about the research title, I can tell you a lot, right? But, uh, and, and that's a very important part of who you are as a nation, right? You know, savage and, and things like that, uh, sustain, uh, supplemental nutrition uh, program, etc. But I'd be way out of my league. Sorry about that. But I can point you in the right direction, though. If you want to know more about that, I can certainly point you in the right direction. And, uh, but I can't answer that question. I'm usually not one to duck any question. I'll take it on. I'm not a politician, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's great that we have uh, one form of interview uh, one kind of uh, people now uh, because of all the technological advances. Now, in your view, are we doing enough to promote sustainability? How are we going to balance our productivity? Um, at the same time, um, promote economic, cultural, uh, yeah. environmental, and social. Right. right. So the dean sitting up front asked me about sustainability. <coughs> what are we doing? What should we be doing? It's not just enough about you know figuring out how we can grow crops. 
So how do you do it in a sustainable manner? And to me, sustainability is a three-legged stool, by the way. And it's the three Ps. It's uh, people, it's planet, it's profits. And those three things need to go hand in hand. You can't say it's all about the environment only. Uh, you got to think that there are people, and there are people that are actually enabling people to live, like this guy sitting right here. And he needs to be able to do the kinds of things that he does, and he should be able to put a little money in his pocket as well. So when you view it from that perspective, you want to take a thoughtful approach to it and not a sort of a knee-jerk reaction saying, you know, it's all about the environment and that's all we care about. Some, some folks, as you know, take that view. So coming to my agency and USDA in general and to my agency in particular, we have several programs in, uh, of funding available and we have to, all the investments that we're making, whether it's the short-term investments or the short-term return on investment or the longer-term horizon, it is with this view that it needs to help develop sustainable approaches. To give you a good example, um, you know, water is probably going to be the defining entity for us as humanity. Right now, it's happening. You know, the wars about water are going to be much more, much worse than the wars about oil. And so, how do you develop the ability to feed one and a half, ten billion people in 40 more years with diminishing water resources? There's a guy named Jason Clay, who's the head of, uh, who was with the World Wide Wildlife Federation. He did an analysis. He said, to sustain the population in the year 2050, with the amount of water we'll have on Earth and the land, arable land, that we'll have on Earth, it'll take two more Earths to feed that population. And he says in the same article, oh, by the way, if you want to live like an American, you need four more Earths. So the systems that we're developing, that we're enabling, USDA is enabling faculty and scientists to do in general, is how can you grow a bushel of corn with one hundredth of the amount of water that it uses today? Already you see the, the genetics that we've got. You know, soybeans would die on, uh, you know, just about five, six years ago, ten years ago. Today they're able to survive, even the kind of drought situation that we've got, right? So there's a lot of research that's going on. Well, how do you improve water use efficiency? How do you improve nitrogen use efficiency? And that's a, at the same time, this farmer here needs to be able to grow that crop and sell that crop, make a little bit of money so he can partake of that, that American dream as well. So that's the approach that we take. And so the investments that we're making today is really with the eye on the fact that we want it to be sustainable, not just for the next 50 years, but, you know, for a very, very long time, as long as humans are able to live on Earth, right? And that's the all of the research projects that we're investing in today, inherent in them, the questions we ask is, how does it become a sustainable effort? And again, with the three Ps in it. That's the approach that we take. And uh, I think, you know, USDA in general is doing this, the National Science Foundation is doing this, they're taking a similar approach, the Department of Energy is taking a similar approach. How do you deal with, you know, global warming? How do you deal with the lack of water? How do you deal with this ever-increasing population? The sad part is the best agricultural lands are also the best land to where we want to establish cities and towns. And indeed, one of my farmer friends back in Oregon used to tell me that it's the three F's. You get fish, flush, and then farm. Right? The fish, the salmon, etc., get their water first, and then the flushing of the toilets gets the second water, that's the cities, and then the poor farmer gets his water. Now, how are you going to expect him to grow the crop that you and I are going to be eating, right? And so that sustainability is a very critical part of, of our core of thinking that we have now. On what you just now said, what is the, uh, you know, USDA uh, ideas on desalinization of the oceans for this water problem, which is eventually going to occur? Right. So uh, we're not investing, we don't have the deep pockets to be able to invest in desalinization type research. We're investing money in developing new varieties of plants, rice and other crops, staple crops, that can grow and develop on in salty water. We're doing that part. But the desalinization aspects of it really are other agencies, federal agencies that are investing money in it. Right now we can desalinate all, you know, all the water we want to, except it's a very expensive proposition. Energetically, it's one of the most expensive propositions we've got. So again, a lot of research that's being enabled by, from an energy perspective, by the Department of Energy. If you go to their, you know, website and check 
the, the kinds of projects that are being provided is trying to figure out how can you get tap into a renewable cheap source of energy, i.e. what's coming from above, you know, solar energy. And can you take that and obtain enough uh, energy from it in a cheap manner? I mean, all the solar panels in the world ain't gonna cut it. This is still too expensive. In a cheap, man inexpensive manner to be able to desalinate. Yeah, you know, Earth is 70% water. So we have a lot of water. So between now and about 20, 30 years from now, I bet you we're going to have it figured out about how to desalinate water. But it does not begin that sustainable investment of dollars. That, that The federal government has a role to play. The state governments have a role to play as well in making those investments. Uh, you know, oftentimes what happens is in the conversations, people forget that there are these public investments that are needed to enable unbelievable public good. And as I was sharing with Ed earlier, Every dollar of public investment made in the agricultural arena has returned $20 to $30 of public good for all the time that we've been investing as a nation, as a states in the nation. Okay, so so that, that's where the action of that is, is in trying to figure out how to make these things happen <coughs> at the very low energy cost. Okay, Dr. Lattimore says one last question because I gotta hit the road. Are you a student? Yes. Sir. Oh, good, thank you. What's your name? My question is, when you said that you want to know about the union, but a lot of us don't know what the U.S. union is. I know I can speak for myself because before I got an internship with the U.S. union, I basically just thought he was fine. There's many of my friends who were down to the situation, which was good actually. Yeah. Um, but saying that the radio and the television is mostly the most important for us, I don't see that in commercials about So I think more commercials may help yeah. educate what we hear from the yeah. Because a lot of them just think it's farming. When I tell them what I want to do or what I'm doing, like I work on farming, okay. they just think that I'm going to be a farmer. But it's more to it that you can do. And I have learned that, yeah. that I can do a job with Homeland Security or the CIA or whatever. A lot of people don't know that. Yep. So maybe commercials. I, I, I hear you. And, and so there's a lot of conversations going yeah. on about how do we use the new media, for example, to, uh, you know, not just television and radio and things like that, because, you know, young people like yourself, yeah. you know, you end up uh, doing a lot more on, uh, you know, YouTube and, and Twitter feeds and uh, so, the so-called new media, right? And, and say, yeah, you do spend time watching the watching television, but you probably watch those shows on the computer, for example, or on your smartphone or an iPad or something like that. And there's a good bit of effort going on trying to figure out how to corral this and, and Indeed, make those things happen. It's unfortunate. The next time your friend asks you, "Hey, are you going to just be a farmer?" You tell them, "Did you eat breakfast this morning, <laughs> or did you want to get some dinner tonight?" That's where I'm going to provide you. If I don't, you're in trouble. That's how I present that. <laughs> that's how I do it. I mean, I think that's the, the biggest problem we have in America is people don't understand where food comes from, right? Somehow, some farmer, poor slob that he is, goes and works in the hot sun and and gets some money, to, you know, grows these crops. And I think it's really incumbent on all of us, uh, I mean that, I mean, for all of us, whenever somebody says to me, oh, you work in agriculture? I say, yes, indeed, I'm very proud of it, and we feed you. I, I say, I start off, I give a lot of talks, this is the choir for me. I give a lot of talks to Rotary clubs and city clubs and things like that, but 98% of the population, that's where, I, that's where the action is at. And, and people say to me, you work in agriculture food? So I ask him, so did you get some breakfast this morning? Yeah. Did you get some lunch? Yeah. Did you get some dinner? Yeah. Did you drink some water? Yeah. Did you breathe in some air? Yeah. Well, that's what we do. That's what these farmers are doing. So it's, it's, got, it's incumbent, particularly on the choir, to need to go out to the congregation and take the opportunity, if you go to church, take the opportunity to talk to the little kids in Sunday school or talk to your congregation saying, you know, ask the pastor, hey, may I say some things about my own experiences, about how I'm getting an education in the Fort Valley State. Take the opportunity to do so. It, it will pay dividends over the long term for all of us. You know? all right, but your point's very well taken. We're, we're trying to figure out how to go about doing that as well. But I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.